Got, he got woken up with a bunch of guys of kafias covering their faces. He had a hand over his mouth, flex cuffed him, put a, another kafia or a shirt over his cuff so people couldn't see that he was cuffed. That's what we didn't cuff him in the back. We cuffed him in the front so he could kind of walk out like this. And so we walk him and his mom out, have the van come around, throw them in the van, hop in the car, and we get off target that way. And one of our sister teams calls us up and says, hey, um, th this, this team, our sister dive team was living in a different part of Baghdad. They didn't have an assault force. They didn't have Iraqis. They were training up. They were doing, doing basically unilateral, um, intelligence operations. And they said, Hey, we, we've got a guy that knows where these American contractors and British contractors are being held. Cause he was in the video and he's, or he, he's, he's identified one of the guys that was in the video. And he knows where he is. And so basically he knew, this source knew where one of the members of the beheading cell was and he was in Abu Ghraib. So they, they briefed up the source and they said, what we need for you guys is we just need a, a handful of people that can blend. They knew that we had been out doing a lot of reconnaissance uh, in the area because we'd recon all of our targets before we hit them in indigenous clothing. Um, we had grabbed a couple guys here and there off the street. Like if you were doing a recon and you can make positive ID, you know, why wait for that night? Why not just grab them now? So we had done a little bit of that, but so our sister team knew that we had that capability. So we loaded up a handful of, of our Iraqis and then four of us Americans that had been out and about in the city a lot. We went out there, we got the brief from them, from that team, and then we went to the local American uh, FOB where the, the big army, the closest big army unit was just to tell them, hey, we're going to go into this area and you know what's your radio frequency can we call you if we get into a get into heavy contact and any of that type of stuff um and that's when that, that's when that that regular army unit was like um you guys can go in there if you want but we don't go in there you know that right and we we're like yeah we're aware we're like what what are the threats they're like yeah we just get stitched up every time we go in there rpgs ieds like these guys aren't playing around I'm like all right well we're taking an opal in a, in a scooby van so <laughs> so i think we're gonna blend in um, and we, I mean, it was night, but it wasn't super late. It was like eight or nine o'clock at night, um, because we needed traffic to blend in with. So if we would have waited till the typical two or three in the morning, like we usually do, there wouldn't have been anybody on the road. So we, we leave in our, our one Opal in the lead and then a, uh, a van trailing much further behind. I'm in the lead vehicle with one other American and other Iraqis. And so we, we get there to the front. It's an apartment complex that we're going into and we're, we're looking for apartment number seven, I think it was. Um, and so we get into where the apartment is and there's a bunch of guys just out there malingering, hanging out, like just young military age guys, you know, uh, it's, it's winter time too. So they've got, it looks like they, they're potentially armed. Um, but we want to get in and get out as, as quietly as we possibly can, because our overall goal is to snatch this member of the beheading cell so that he can't we can snatch him. We can get information on where the hostages are being held. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't if, if we end up having to go loud and we end up like killing the guy or whatever, then the hostages get moved and we got nothing. So our whole goal is to get in there as quietly as possible. So before we left, we basically said like no English on target. And so we're all dressed up. I had a dish dash on with my M4 underneath it. Had one of those like breakaway dish dashes, um, light skin body armor underneath it, and then a kafia covering my face. Uh, and that's basically how all the Americans are dressed. Iraqis are dressed similar. Luckily, our Iraqis went up first, made contact to talk to the guys that were out front. They said something to the effect of, um, we're with one of the other groups. I think answer all soon. Like we're with this group. Don't don't say shit. Just stand here. Like if you know it's good for you, just stand here. And so we kind of file past. We go. And we know the guy's name. One of our Iraqis knocks on the door. The dude's mom like cracks the door, you know. And I'm pulling security in the hallway, um, just trying to make sure that nobody comes up the hall. And she cracks the door. And our Iraqi says, "Hey, is I think the guy's name was Ziad or Jabbar or something like that. Is Ziad here?" And she's like, "No, he's sleeping." And he, he's, he said, okay, well, I really need to talk to him. He kind of got her to crack the door open a little bit more, just enough for him to get his foot in. Right when he got his foot in, like we, we silently flow in there. One of the Iraqis puts the hands over the mom's mouth. We come in and like literally her son, this kid is just asleep on a sleeping mat, like on a bed, AK by him and a phone by him. He's a kid? Yeah, he's, I don't know, teenager maybe. Um, maybe he was in his twenties, but young yeah. enough, young yeah. enough that he's still, 
uh, not married and living with his, his parents. It, al- it always interests me how young some of these leaders are, Yeah, you know, on the opposing side. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was 24 at the time. And so he's probably, probably he looked like he was younger than me, but they're asleep. So we got him. We keep his mom gagged, um, grab him. And now we have to get out. And so our Iraqis kind of walked ahead. They made sure the hallway was clear. And so his mom's freaked out. Was he combative at all? No, because we basically got him. Like he got he got woken up with a bunch of guys of kafias covering their faces in his face, saying, "Just give us your hands." And he like, he looked around and he was you know he had a hand over his mouth. Flex cuffed him, put a another kafia or shirt over his cuff so people couldn't see that he was cuffed. That's what we didn't cuff him in the back. We cuffed him in the front so he could kind of walk out like this. And so we walk him and his mom out, have the van come around, throw them in the van, hop in the car. And we get off target that way. Um, had to drive them all the way back. At, at the time, we didn't know this. Unbeknownst to us, there's a big fight going on between uh, the unit that's charged with getting hostages and in our command. So we get off target. And this is before, you know, we had very good radios. So somebody just calls my buddy on his little crappy Iraqi cell phone and is like, you guys got to take him to the airfield right now. So we took the prisoners and dropped them off with, you know, the guys that were going after the hostages right away um unfortunately we were they i I don't know what happened there um but unfortunately we we didn't get those hostages our cali ended up beheading them a couple days later Um, i'm not sure if we there was an argument like should we keep them and tactically interrogate them ourselves because this is before the big lake this is before there was a lot of restrictions on us interrogating people and so we definitely our team wanted to keep them and interrogate them because we knew the target set we had kind of been all over this we felt that we could move faster Above my pay grade, we lost that food fight, and we ended up having to hand the the detainees back over uh, to the guys at the airfield, and it kind of went from there. Who was at the airfield? Was it? Was it was JSOC. It, it was JSOC. Yeah, I don't remember if it was you know if it was the army guys, or the navy guys, or whoever it was. But it was JSOC command that our that our command was fighting with. This is and this is like 04, So this is before everybody was fully integrated. You know, years mm-hmm. later, there was just the SODEF, and I think there was a lot more conductivity, but there was still a ton of rivalry, and there was not flat communication. I, I don't think our efforts were very synchronized in those those years. How long after was it that the, the hostages were be beheaded? It's a couple of days later. Damn. Yeah, it's a couple Damn. days later. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, so that that whole summer of summer and into fall of 04, that was probably a lot of the that was some of the biggest work that we did. We were doing a little bit against the the Shia militias, but Zarqawi kept grabbing Americans and Brits and beheading them. And so we were trying to run down Zarqawi's Baghdad based kidnapping operations. And that was probably the, the hairiest mission that we did. But we had quite a few other ones. We were we were out broad daylight, Haifa Street, places where the army had like literally still smoldering Bradley fighting vehicles that had gotten lit up and we're out there in our little like opals dressed up like Iraqis trying to trying to find guys. Yeah. I mean I gotta be honest, that's pretty heads up, you know, it's 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 been a long time since I've been in a in a uh, mission planning session, but but to pick up on the traffic patterns like that that early, yeah. did we even have a curfew in place at that time? Mm-mm. You know, no. to pick up on those traffic patterns. I mean that's not going too late to blend in with the traffic. I mean, did you, were your guys' commandos advising you on how to dress and how yeah. to blend in? Yeah. So really early on. I and mean, that's an art in itself. A big time, man. Big time. So we, we got tasked, hey, just stand up commandos. And there was a guy on my team who'd been around for freaking ever, legendary guy. Um, and he was really big on reconnaissance and he was really big on like unconventional solutions. That was his whole thing. He was like, there's a bunch of other people in SOF who get paid to kick indoors and shoot dudes in the face. Like, he's mm-hmm. like, we can do that. He's like, but if some other unit can do it, then it's probably not what we need to be doing. He's like, but we, we know languages, we know cultures, we know unconventional warfare. This is our lane. So early on, he had a vision of grabbing some of our Iraqis that had like a little more aptitude, putting them through a, a more reconnaissance oriented selection process. Um, and then also picking them based on what part of the city they were from and then like broader picture, what part of the country they were from really developed a, a good initial pool of sources. But those guys like right off the bat were a godsend to us because they were the ones that were teaching us like, you know, how to dress traffic patterns. Like what do, what, what do IPs, what do the Iraqi police notice on a vehicle that's going to get you burned? Cause this is before Iraq really had like a, a vehicle registration system. It got much more complicated. I know you guys probably dealt with this in GRS. It got much more complicated later on 
with the whole like license plate thing, but things were still much more wild west back then. But just basically, how do you move through the sea that is, you know, Baghdad or, or greater Iraq without getting detected? No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.